And uh, it, it was always good. One can never go wrong going through past exam papers and you know, doing the exercise of trying to answer them. Uh, the excellent exercises, answering past exam papers and assignment questions uh, in preparation for the exam. You know, nothing can actually prepare you better for writing the exam than answering exam papers so that you are exam ready. Um, you know, it's very hard if you come into the exam, you know, it's time to write the exam, but in your case, it's a bit different. I understand you're taking the assessment, well, the assessment will be done online you know, because of the COVID restrictions, but uh, nonetheless, um, you know, uh, it is good to um, be ready for the exam, having the experience and having the, uh, you know, done the activity of writing out the answers to questions, okay? Because that is what uh, the, the exam is many times about, writing out answers to questions. Okay? And if it is something that you only do, uh, you know, when you enter the exam room for the first time, it becomes a bit, it will be a bit of a difficult experience. Okay, but you got a bit of an exception this time around. It's a take home assessment. Um, you will be given the exam for 24 hours, during which time you must go and uh, find the answers. Okay. Um, it's always a good idea that when you get the exam paper to actually mark off those questions that you that you know the answer to and do them first and leave the questions to which you do not know the answers to, uh, to, to answer them after you've done the questions that you do know the answers to, okay? So here is some interesting questions. Um, let's get into them, okay? Okay, so like guys, it's only the three of you, but what I want to um, encourage you to do is to, you know, um, ask questions. If there's anything unclear, uh, I'll try and explain and assist where I can, um, you know, and uh, use this, this opportunity uh, to, you know, to get a better understanding, to ask me to, to clarify and to explain concepts that you've got difficulty with. Okay, so this is from a 2011 paper. Uh, the questions are, are in principle, so they're not difficult uh, in the sense, not difficult, but they they will be, it's quite, uh, uh, you know, possible that these questions could come in the exam. Um, discuss the principle of separate legal personality and explain the circumstances, if any, under which this principle may be disregarded. Refer to relevant case law. Okay. Now, what are we talking about here? Separate legal, legal personality of a company. What's the general principle? Um, these are, this comes up early in the study of company law. Right? It's a very basic uh, chapter, an introductory chapter especially, in the prescribed textbook as well, um, in which the... The writers try to make us understand how important it is. How does the law regard the existence of a company? Okay, so this question can be asked, like many questions, they can be asked for more marks. You've been asked here to, to answer it for six marks, but um, you know you can easily ask or allocate a marker, could easily allocate 10, 15, 20 marks even for a question like this. Okay, so the principle, as we know, of legal personality is that a company is regarded as completely separate from the people that represent it, namely the directors. And as we learned from our early study of, of law that you have natural persons and you've got juristic persons, right? And an example, a juristic person is a company, a corporate entity. And the law regards it as separate. Um, but the confusion will always come when people, um, uh, you know, 
is a confusion sometimes that uh, the company and the person are one and the same thing. The company and the director are one and the same thing. This is the confusion, the difficulty that uh, comes about. Okay. So the first English case on this is the classical case of Salomon versus Salomon Limited. And Mr. Salomon was the director of this company and his, his wife and his son or family were shareholders, minority shareholders. And people dealt with this company called Salomon Limited. And um, the, 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 you know, he was the face of the company, so to speak. And the company went into difficulty and uh, it couldn't pay its debts. And the creditors of the company, the people of the company owed money, they sued the company, Salomon Limited. And when they sued the company, they found out that the company had no money, no assets of real value. But Mr. Salomon sat with lots of assets and wealth. And this was the argument. The argument of the creditors was that this company, Mr. Salomon himself and the company are but one thing. Mr. Salomon is the face of the company. Um, you know, why is he now using this excuse that the company's got no money? Whereas he, as the director of the company, is actually the person, he is Salomon Limited. And the court made it very clear that, no, these are two distinct entities. Mr. Salomon didn't, um, you know, he's always been the director of the company. The contracts that you have are with the company, not with Mr. Salomon personally. And therefore, your attempt to hold him personally liable, Mr. Salomon, cannot, uh, cannot be uh, upheld. The company is a separate entity. It has the right to own its own property, the right to sue people, and the right to be sued in its own name. There's nothing um, to, to, to show that the company, um, you know, uh, and Mr. Salomon are one and the same thing. They are separate. He's only the director, and you can't hold him liable. Okay, so that very um, classic case, Salomon Limited, it comes from English law. Uh, in, the 18, in 1897, so it's an old English case. It's a classic case in, in, on, on this point of um, the separate personality of a company. And um, another case in South African law is Kruger's Dope personality versus Dadu, or Dadu versus Kruger's Dope municipality. Uh, now, this is a very interesting case. This was in the early 1920s in South Africa. Uh, what was then known as the Appellate Division. And it's an interesting case. Um, Mr. Dadu was an Indian gentleman who, uh, you know, at those days, it was in the apartheid times, and Mr. Dadu wanted to, you know, buy a business. He wanted to buy property and a business in the Krugersdorp municipality, which was some place in the free state. But the law forbid not to allow for people who were Indians of Indian origin to own land in that municipality. Okay, because Mr. Dadu was an Indian person. And uh, what Mr. Dadu then did was, what do you think Mr. Dadu did? Mr. Dadu then incorporated a company of which he uh, was a director, or he was a shareholder, and we had a nominee, somebody else, uh, who was the director, but he was the majority shareholder in the company. And, uh, you know, the company, this land, and the company ran it, and, you know, and then the people, the authorities found out that he is an Indian person in this, in a municipality, in Krugersdorp, in the free state, who owns this property here in this business and is doing business and uh, it should not be, it's not allowed. Uh, and they took it to court. Okay, and they said that this is a hoax, this is a trick, it's just a ruse, it's, it's something that they're trying here because uh, the owner of the business is actually, the controlling person is actually Mr. Dadu, who is an Indian person. Um, and when he was sued, Mr. Dadu raised this point and said, well, I'm not the owner in my personal capacity. 
the owner is this company called Hydro Limited. Um, they are the owners. And what did the court say? The court upheld this ruling of Mr. Daidu and said, yes, um, that uh, a company is separate. A company is entitled to own its own property. And uh, he, got a, he, he, he was victorious in that case. That Daidu Limited uh, is a separate entity and can own property separately. It wasn't Mr. Daidu himself who was the owner, as he proved. Um, well, a short while after that, they changed the law. Uh, in free state to say that uh, even companies that are owned by Indians and other uh, groups, uh, you know, race groups, are not allowed to own these properties. That's how they got, say, they fixed that again. But the point remains that, and that was goes to show, um, in this question, you asked to like discuss the separate legal personality of a company, and um, uh, you must now make these points that look, it is that the general rule is that a company is a separate legal personality, a separate legal entity, and it has these rights as a separate legal entity to own things in its own name, to sue and be sued, etc. And, um, you know, the courts are hesitant. The court does not have a discretion, so to speak, a general discretion to disregard that. Okay. Now, you need to, these three important cases. So there's the Salomon case, the Dado Limited case. There was the case in uh, Bester versus Van Niekerk. Or, you know, uh, was it Bester versus Now, where the court said this was again 19, the 1950s. Okay, that was the old common law, the 1920s English, uh, I mean, uh, you know, court decision. And the, the principle came to the court again that, you know, under what circumstances can one disregard? That was the question. Under what circumstances can one disregard uh, the company's personality? And when we speak of holding, uh, disregarding a company's uh, personality, there's a term used in you know, common legal parlance. We call that piercing the corporate veil, which basically means that you disregard. And this is what they're asking you to do. Under what circumstances can this be disregarded? Okay, what's that principle? The principle of the company is separate from the people that represented the directors. So when can you disregard it? So I'm going to ask you guys, do you know when a company's separate personality, uh, can a company's uh, separate personality be disregarded? That's the first question. And if so, under what circumstances? Yeah, it's a very quiet class at the internet. Miss Lichi and Kamalo and Nadine, what do you say? Okay, you say it can be. Now, what under what circumstances? Okay, this is in the very early chapters in your textbook and your study guides. That's right. Lifting the corporate veil or piercing the corporate veil. That's right. What is the test? What is the current test? The test has gone through many things over the decades, over the past hundred years. Right? And what is the current test now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is it? Okay, let me break it down for you because this is how you need to answer the question, guys. The question is, you must discuss this principle that the company is separate from the directors. All right, so you must make mention in your answer that, look, a company is generally, the general rule is a company is separate, is a separate legal entity from the people that represent it. Right? Um, and you can't normally hold the people that represent the company personally liable. That is the general rule. But now the thing is, my question was, can you pierce the corporate veil? And you saying yes. Now my question to you now is, 
when can you do that? When can you hold the directors personally liable? For the actions of the company. Okay, so there is been there's been a change in the in, in, in the requirements of it. There used to be the old test that used to be an unconscionable injustice. Okay, and when the directors have, um, in, in, you know, it was the test in the 19 case of Bester versus Van Niekerk, okay, where the court said that only the court cannot the corporate personality of the company and hold and pierce the corporate veil, hold the directors personally liable, um, only if the, it is an un, there's an unconscionable abuse of the status of the company, okay. And then in, 19, in the 1990s, um, there was the case of um, Cape Pacific versus Labne, you know, where the court said, the court made the point again, this was a Cape, a Cape Town, a Cape High Court decision, where it said that, you know, the company is separate from its directors, and um, it, that is the rule, but the court said when there is evidence that the directors have acted fraudulently, you know, improperly and with dishonesty, um, and he limited it to those instances, said when they've abused the company's personality, when there's evidence of fraud, improper conduct and dishonesty, only then can the company, the directors be personally liable and the director, uh, the, the corporate veil pierced as it is, or as it were. Okay. Now we've got a new thing in the Companies Act. There's a test, the new act of 2008, the relatively new act of 2008 gives us another test. It says that the company can be, uh, you can disregard that a, 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 uh, the personality of, or let's just simply put it this way, that the, the uh, Personality of of a uh, of the or rather the corporate veil of a company can be pierced or lifted when there has been an unconscionable abuse. This is now the new test, okay? In terms of the act, that is an, been an unconscionable abuse of the company's uh, personality, and uh, when that has been proven, then the director the veil can be lifted. And the directors can be personal. Okay, so it, it's a very topical thing. Um, you know, it's always been discussed. I mean, if you guys watch the Zondo Commission, and you'll see there how those directors, those are, they are ex-directors of SAA, of of ESCOM, of Transnet, and they've been questioned now. What were you guys doing? You know, and what the what were you doing in terms of other laws that you how you conducted your position in a um, and and, and very, they could very well be held, um, you know, uh, under this question now that, you know, can we hold them personally liable for what they did while they were directors there, okay? Now, like I say, the this question is asking you to discuss that under what circumstances can we disregard the separate personality of a company. Uh, I mentioned two or three cases there. You also, you know, so you should mention one, one, one or two or three cases. That is mentioned in the textbook, you know, the Salomon case, the Dadu case, the Besta case, and then you need to mention the Act, okay, where it says that uh, when there's been unconscionable abuse of the company's personality, can the directors be our personal liable? Um, you guys must also understand the way that the new Act operates, the new Companies Act operates, is such that. Um, you know, you it's not that difficult to hold a director liable. They don't approach it from this point of view that much. Okay, they point take it from the point of view of, of the duties of the director. Okay, a director's got certain duties, his fiduciary duties and his duties of uh, care and skill. And when the director has been found wanting in, in you know, or in violation of those duties, then he the his provision clearly. In terms of you know section 76, 74, 75, and 76 of the new companies act, uh, which makes provision for them to be personally liable, 
and also furthermore to be declared delinquent and to be placed under probation. Okay, so for six marks, it's quite a bit here, um, but you should be able to break this down. Okay, this is in the, um, if you're struggling to break it down, you can give me, you know, you can ask me about it. Are there, are there any questions here about that? What I'm trying, what you must not do, guys, is, I mean, um, you must sort of, here you must give more information, okay? You must discuss this principle. I've explained it to you now. And what are the circumstances under which the personality of a company can be disregarded, okay? So you can discuss that. There's four or five things that you can mention. Nowadays, the company offers, uh, forming a company, uh, you know, obviously, you know, when you when you read and studied other chapters of the textbook regarding why you want to start a company, it's obviously for protection, isn't it? You start a company so that you can limit your liability, so that you can place risks and, and, and those kinds of things in the company. Uh, that is why people start companies, right? They don't please keep things in their personal names so that they, for various reasons, cannot be held personally liable. But if you use the company, um, you know, to commit a fraud or to cheat people, uh, then, or to do something dishonest, then uh, the, for, for the formation of the company will not, under the new companies, act be much, of, uh, much help to you. Okay. There's more provisions in the new act making, putting more onerous, more duties on, on directors than before. Okay, any questions, guys? Nadine, Miss Lichi, and still Mrs. Kamala. Are we all clear? Are we following? Is there anything you'd like to ask? No? Okay, then we go on. Question two. Thule and Tabo want to form a non-profit company. Advise them what the requirements for this type of company are. Four marks. It's a nice, simple question. What are the requirements for a non-profit company? Anybody? Nobody ever ever heard of a non-profit company? NPC is Okay, we've heard about it. And you said, Ms. someone saying here, yeah, Ms. Kamala or Mr. Kamala is saying it must be formed for the benefit of the public. Mm, that is, um, well, is that what they're asking us? Mm, the question is, what the requirements? So they want to start it. What do they need? Right, they come to you now for advice. What are you going to tell them? What are the requirements for this kind of company? Hmm. Okay, so with this kind of company, um, the, you know, the way that companies are classified and you know the way they discussed in the textbook and the study guide is they make a distinction between profit companies on the one hand and non-profit companies on the other okay and the profit companies you'll get private public state-owned enterprises personal liability companies on the other hand you only have non-profit companies and non-profit companies are different from profit companies in that the objectives of the company are quite different right 
the objectives or you'll find in the MOI of the company, the Memorandum of Incorporation, right, which is the document that you need to submit to the company commissioner when you incorporate the company. So in that MOI, you need to have the objective of the company as either the promotion of sport, culture, charity, um, those kinds of things, okay, which are non-profit in nature, okay? So that is, you must have, that is your objective. You must also in your memorandum, um, you know, say that what, uh, how you will, um, what will happen to the assets of this company when the company becomes liquidated or it dissolves. Okay. So, so that the assets of such a in of such a company cannot be divided among the the the, the 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 representatives of this company. They must be either transferred to another company who has the same objectives. Okay, but it cannot be divided personally. You also need at least three directors in an NPC. Okay, and one of the requirements is you, as you saying, you not to have members. Okay, maybe you must explain that. Uh, what do you mean, like, not to have members? Yeah, not the net value, but all the assets of the company when it liquidates, when it winds up, when it's, it, it's you know, dissolved, it, that, at that point it must be given to uh, a similar organization and not be divided among the members, okay? All companies uh, must have representatives or members. Um, okay, <laughs> now thanks, at least you, you are, you know, but now be aware now, so. You 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 you're guessing that's fine, but uh, make an accurate guess by looking at your textbook, okay? Looking at your textbook and knowing where to find the information in order that you can pass the exam. Um, if you're going to guess in the exam, yeah, that's a high risk. That's a high risk. I wouldn't do that. I would consult textbooks and you know go through past papers and compare answers and that kind of thing. Um, so. Um, those are the requirements, okay? There must at least be three directors. They, that must be in the objectives there of the company. And um, that must be the, um, is your answers wrong? Yes, have you been listening to my answers, uh, Ms. Litchie? Compare what uh, you have said there to what I have been saying, and then you will know now. Uh, if they are wrong, right? So one of your requirements is it's uh, one of the requirements then is then the company is not required to have members. Um, that you must explain. That's not true because if it doesn't have members, then how is the company going to be represented? Perhaps what you mean is that it doesn't have shareholders, like a profit company. Okay, so that's true. There's no share capital that is required. As such, okay, the is a, a the directors are appointed, and there must be a minimum of at least three. Okay, the the MOI, the memorandum of incorporation, must say that the purpose of the company, the objectives of the company, is not to make profit, but to promote either sport or culture or religion or charity and that kind of thing. Okay, and that like fourthly, it must also have one of its objectives is that. Um, when the company is wound up, that it will, its assets, what it owns, cannot be divided amongst the members, but must be given to another organization with a similar objective. Okay. Any questions? It was for four marks. Okay. Question 1.3, Susan wants to draft a memorandum of incorporation for a company that is going to be, okay, which matters will be dealt with in 
the memorandum of incorporation. Now, let us quickly go and see what the memorandum of incorporation is. Who can tell me in very, you know, you don't have to write it in the chat box. You can speak. I prefer if you speak because only the three of us here, four of us all together. So what, um, what is the memorandum? If you understand what the MOI actually is, then it will actually help you to answer this question. Okay. She wants, Susan wants to draft the MOI. Now the question is, what must the MOI contain? But before we go there, tell me guys, what is the MOI? It's a starting point. What is an MOI of a company? Yes, please, Ms. Kamalo. You have your hand up? Yes, please, if you want to say something. Okay, Ms. Kamala says the MO is a document that guides the director company on formation. Yes, that is a uh, that's true. It's a very broad description of the MOI, yes, but uh, it's not untrue. It's true what you say. When you want to start a company, okay, the company tells you how you must go about to, to start it. The word we use is incorporate or register the company, right? So there's a document known as the NOI, in for Nelly, the Notice of Incorporation, which must be completed. And in this notice, you are you make a reference to your MOI and your MOI, the company in fact gives you standard MOIs. Okay, certain MOIs it gives you that you can adopt, uh, you know, to your company. Okay, it depending on what you, mean, you don't only get one kind of company, you get different kinds of companies. So it makes uh, logical sense that for every type of company you get, I mean, you get a profit company, a non profit company. Then in the profit company sector, you get a private company, you get a public company, a state-owned enterprise. So they all kind of have the same kind of MOI. I mean the same MOI. Each category of those companies may have very similar MOIs, okay? So MOI is a formal document that sets out the internal rules of the company. Yes. Uh, Ms. Litchie says it's an important document that enables flexibility as to the relationship between a company and its stakeholders. A summary of the business rules. Yes, okay. So have you been following what I've been saying? That it is the rules of how the company is to be internally run. Okay. And uh, like I said, the standard MOIs that you can adopt. These are... Uh, uh, annex just to the act where a company can decide and de depending upon the type of company of course you will adopt your uh, the MOI accordingly so one has a choice one can adopt the standard MOI one can adopt the standard MOI with changes amendments deletions okay things that you take out uh, as it applies to your company if there's restrictive conditions Okay, in the company about the internal running that should be mentioned in there. And the you can even don't have to adopt the formal MOI given to you in the company's act. You can adopt your own company internal rules, your own kind of MOI. And this must be 
mentioned in the the MOI itself, okay? And a copy of the company's internal rules must also be, uh, you know, attached when you form the company, when you incorporate the company. So a lot of flexibility, as you mentioned, uh, is permitted under the new Companies Act 2008, okay? Um, it wants to, it, it's allowing companies to regulate, okay, the relationships internally to be self-regulated. So the Companies Act Section 15 and Section 16 that deals with um, you know, the, uh, the MOI, what must be in the MOI, Section 15 and Section 16 of the Act, in fact tells you, well, you know, what can be altered. So we speak of what we call alterable and unalterable provisions in the MOI. Uh, and this is the general rule by which one can, uh, uh, you know, adopt an MOI. The Companies Act allows you, like I mentioned, to, to even adopt your own set of company rules, provided, you see, there are limits to these things, provided that it doesn't violate any company, uh, any provision in the Companies Act. So that is where what we call unalterable provisions, where the Act allows you, or doesn't allow you to change certain things in your MOI, and there are certain things that it allows you to change. And where it allows you to change, you can change it, um, you know, uh, as you see fit, as long as it doesn't violate any provisions of the Companies Act. So, for example, on the subject of, of meetings of a company, okay, remember it regulates all the internal things of the company. So what's it going to mention? It's going to mention the objectives. It's going to mention directors. It's going to mention the powers of the directors, okay? Um, it's going to mention meetings. It's going to, you know, give detail about that. So the standard MOI will already be compliant to the Act. It depends on how you're going to adapt it. So it sets out certain minimums. The MOI sets out certain minimums by which uh, people can adapt to companies, and you cannot uh, change the, the MOI below those minimums. Then, it be, then you are dealing with an unalterable provision. Okay. I'll give you a, a quick example so that you can understand. Um, in, you know, I don't know if you've done labor law, but for example, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, you know, that act sets out the very basic minimums that may be agreed upon between an employer and an employee. Just to give you the example of our MOI, uh, you know, is in that way similar, in, you know, the basic minimums. Um, like, for example, you know, the, the, the basic conditions of employment is that uh, women are allowed to take four months maternity leave. Okay. Now, that is the minimum. If your employer tells you, no, you have to, I'm going to give you three months maternity leave. Um, and um, you sign such a contract. Okay. The fact that you've signed it for three months, but the act says the minimum is four months, means now that that will not be enforceable because it's the, it's in violation of the basic minimum. Okay, so in the same way, the MOI of a company sets out the minimum rules, the minimum limits by which you can, um, uh, you know, prepare internal company rules. Okay, so you can agree to anything. So for example, for a meeting of shareholders, you must give 10 days notice. Right. According when we come to the subject of meetings, meetings, the minimum time period for meetings is 10 days, 10 days notice. So can you change the MOI to say, well, meetings for shareholders will be seven days? Do you think you could better change it now? To change the notice period to come to a company meeting no, you can't. All right, good. You can't do that because that is an unalterable. It cannot be changed according to the Act. But can you change it to, let's say, make it 15 days? Right, so you get my point, right? So you, you can change it. You can change it beyond that, okay? But you cannot change it below the prescribed minimum. All right, so this is it, at least five matters that will be in there. You can see it will deal with um, 
It's a very easy, yes, it is in line with the basic requirement, yes, of, of what the company's app permits for MOIs to have, okay? So the basic things in the companies, the MOI will be the company name, the company's, uh, you know, business, uh, the nature of the business, the, the meetings, how meetings will be conducted, the directors and the powers and how they may be removed, um, the, uh, you know, the, the auditing of or, or how documents or financials of the company are to be dealt with, are they going to be audited or not, you know, the company may be a private company and uh, I may not, um, you know, with a, a low PI score, public interest score. In other words, it doesn't earn above a certain amount or as a certain as a small number of employees and therefore may not be required to have fully audited statements. OK, but may have to go for what we call an independent review rather than an, uh, 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 a full on audit. OK, so it can deal with things like that. So there's many things that the MOI you can mention there, and they ought to be found in section 15 of the Companies Act. Okay. Are there any questions on that? Cool, we move on. Question two over here, 2.1. You are approached by James who lives in Cape Town. He is in the process of registering a company name the company's main business is the manufacturing and selling of biscuits. The company name he wants to register is Royal Creams. He is concerned that the name may not be accepted as the name Romani Creams is used by a company in Gauteng. Romani Creams PTY Limited that also sells biscuits. According to James, he is using different packaging, so he ought to be allowed to register the company name. He is, however, worried that the matter may end up in court. Advise him on the criteria for company names in terms of the Companies Act of 2008. Okay, nice little question. What would you tell James to do? So he believes that no, um, you know, uh, uh, but he's concerned. He's, he's concerned. He does, he believes, look, um, he uses a different packaging for his biscuit product, but he is concerned that the matter um, may end up in court. So what would you advise James on these particular issues about the registration of a company name? What are the rules regarding company name uh, uh, registration? Hello. Hi, uh, yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, if he wants to register a company name that is close to names, um, it will confuse the Companies Act states clearly that when one is choosing a company name, it must be unique or it must not be close to a name that is already trading and it mustn't, conf it mustn't um, cause confusion to the public or to intended right. customers. Right, exactly. Very good, that is about it. Okay, you've got, you almost got the full marks there for those five marks, okay? So this is dealt with in section 11 and section 12. Um, there's various sections, uh, various uh, pro, uh, you know, requirements that are given for choosing of a public name. In practice, what, would one, what one would do before you start a company is that you would first reserve the name, okay? There's a process in the company's act before you start your NOI or together with your NOI, your notice of incorporation, you first reserve the name. 
and if the name is, uh, you know, approved, then you can proceed with the registration. So that is one way. However, sometimes, and, and normally the, you know, the, the company's registration authority, known as uh, CIPC, C-I-P-C, the Company's Intellectual Property Commission, they, you know, try and prevent um, disputes like this by first asking you to reserve a name. And the test is that the name must not be uh, confusingly similar to any other name in that field. Okay, so the ultimate test is, a, uh, you know, if they ask you for to refer to a court case, there's a Peregrinus case, uh, and uh, the court reiterated that, you know, when deciding whether a name should not be registered, a company name shouldn't be registered or not, they will look at those criteria that will the public uh, be confused about the name. Okay, so uh, Romani, Royal Creams and Romani Creams in the area of biscuits um, is, a, is a great chance that it can um, cause the public to be confused about, uh, you know, this product. And um, if that is the case, it will disallow that name to be registered. Okay. Um, you're not allowed to register names that are, are offensive, abusive, or are confusingly similar to well-known trademarks. However, royal creams in, let's say, in the cosmetics industry, if you are making, uh, if you, James was manufacturing, let's say, uh, skin cream, do you think, uh, uh, what, you'd, what would you advise James on such an issue? Would he, could he still apply for it, or what do you think? Um, the Companies Act states clearly that um, when one is registering a name and there's already one that's already trading, it, it should clearly um, reflect that it doesn't hold any affiliation with that company. So I think it wouldn't be possible for him to use that name because we already have Romani creams in biscuits and one would think it's affiliated with biscuits. Yes, but my question was, yes, you're right, but now would the same principle that you've explained now also apply in the area of, uh, or the business of cosmetics, facial creams? No, it wouldn't. Mm. You see, this is my point. So, would you still tell James, um, that, you know, that what did you, would you advise to James change, or would it be the same? I would advise him to change it. Mm, well, because you, you shouldn't be concerned if he's selling using that name in the industry that is completely. You know, remember, the test is that members of the public mustn't be confused, right? Yes. So, if we have uh, a product where you sell royal cream, you know, it's a cream for for dry skin and for, you know, if you want glowing skin, uh, would the public be thinking of Romani creams, you know, compared to, I mean, what's it, the Romani, uh, what's the other product? Yeah. It's the Royal um, Creams. Yeah, Royal Creams. If he sells Royal Creams in, as, as a cosmetic product, uh, it's unlikely that the public... They're not be, related. Yeah, yes. Okay, very good. Next question. Lissedi... Uh, this is for five marks. Lesedi and CPV registered a private company, Perry PTY Limited. Okay, that's the name of their company, to sell office equipment. The board of directors consisted of Lesedi, CPV, a nominee of Lesedi, and a nominee of CPV. Okay, so these are other people that they nominated. The MOI provided for the appointment of a managing director who would also be authorized to contract on behalf of the company, but none was appointed. Okay. The CAD, though, never appointed as such, acted as a managing director with the full knowledge of the board of directors. He instructed Office Supplies Limited, a company manufacturing office equipment to supply office equipment to Perry Limited, uh, Perry Limited failed to pay for these purchases. Upon being sued by PTY Limited, Perry Limited resisted the claim on the grounds that Lesedi was not authorized to bind the company. Discuss whether Perry would be bound by the contract. Perry, uh, Perry PTY Limited would be bound by the contract 
you need to discuss the doctrine of estoppel. Okay, so what do you guys think here? Just trying to think the question. I discussed this with another class, which was, uh, which appeared in the tutorial letter. Um, and it was such similar facts. Look at that. Um, I don't know, let me ask you guys, is this the first time you see this question? Did this question not appear in your, any of your assignments or recent exam papers perhaps? In the study guide. In the study guide, eh? Not in the tutorial letters. Okay. All right. So what are we dealing with here now? What do you, how would you answer this question? Well, only five marks. In fact, the challenge of this question is the fact that it is only five marks because it requires a bit of explanation. And one, I say, you know, like I've said before, you can actually, a questioner or rather an examiner could ask you to, to could allocate perhaps even 10 marks to a question like this, okay, or more. Uh, but you know, they're only asking you to answer it in five marks. You're in your script here. So how would you go about answering this? What is the question? Okay. We're dealing with the concept of authority now. So there's this board of directors. There's the two directors and two nominees. There's four people on the board. The MOI says something. The MOI says that um, there's a managing director that must actually represent the company and must sign contracts. Okay, but they've never actually done that. Now, remember the MOI. Let's go back to the MOI, guys. When you register, when you register a company, uh, right, with SIPC, that is the Companies Intellectual Property Commission, and, uh, you know, you comply with all the requirements of registration, and um, they give you a registration certificate, right, to confirm that the company is registered. Now, that MOI that you submitted, which we, in the question before this, we ask, like, what must be inside the MOI, right? So all those things, the objectives, the formalities, the restrictive provisions. Uh, in this case of, of, of this question, now uh, this MOI says that there must be a managing director. Although there's a board, but it says there, there must be a managing director who must actually represent the company. Now, this MOI, is it a public document? That's my question. Is this MOI a public document? This Luigi says yes. Aha, okay. So Ms. Lichi says yes, and Ms. Komalu says no, it's for internal use. Now that is actually, both of you are, um, you know, need to be qualified. Okay, so there's like sort of a particular answer to this question. Look, the thing is, the rule is this. Once you register the company, that MOI is a public document. Right? In other words, public means that, uh, you know, there's a rule on company law that says that once a company registered, there's the rule of disclosure. It has told you certain things by virtue of the publication of the MOI. Okay? So the MOI can be um, inspected. It can be uplifted by any member of the public once the company is registered. Right? So if I see your company registration number, I can check the records of SIPSI and I can, for a fee, or if I, 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 I'm a member there, on, on its website, and I can go and see who the company is, who, what the company is about. I can know a lot of things about the company 
uh, as so far as the public information of the company is concerned. And what I put in the MOI is public. So from that point of view, yes, it's a public document. But now, the fact that you speak of internal use, Ms. Kamalo, must be explained. That internal usage, sometimes the MOI speaks of, like it did say the, uh, in this question, that the, the board, these board members, and there must be a managing director that must be appointed. So what does the public know as far as the public documents of the company are concerned? What does it know about this company now? With a reference to the question. Yes, information of the directors, of course, but doesn't the question say that the MOI says that there must be a, what does it say here in the question there? It says that the, there must be the appointment of? information of the directors, but in terms of authority. Okay, and that was not my question. We need to go very slowly so that if we understand this, then we will understand the question. We, we said that the MOI is a public document, right? Members of the public are able to access it. They can read it. Now, when we uplift it, let's say we uplift the MOI of Perry PTY Limited, what do we see? We see that the MOI says that the company, the chairman, there should be a chairman of the company, the board, right? Uh, it provides for the appointment of a managing director who is also authorized to enter into contracts on behalf of the company. So if you were to uplift those company documents, you would know that at least, won't you? Okay, the MOI says that there must be, it doesn't say who, but it simply says that there must be a, uh, a, a managing director appointed of this, of this company. Now, that is, that is public. All right? So we know that. that. We know that the requirement of the MOI is that there must be a managing director. All right. But do we know as outsiders that they actually did appoint somebody where they went through that formal process to appoint the direct the managing director exactly Ms. Lucci, that we don't know right because that is the internal requirement that is the internal thing we don't know that the only thing we knew was that the company's, um, the company's uh, MOI said that there must be a managing director appointed. That we know. But whether, in fact, the managing director was appointed by the board, uh, that we don't know. All right. So as people dealing with the company, as outsiders, we only know that there should be a, a director, but we don't, uh, managing a director, but we don't know whether, in fact, the director was actually appointed. Okay, so this is where company law rules come in. It, remember, when we deal with the documents of the company, there is this rule called the Turquand rule. You know that said that when a company, the Turquand rule in company law, Turquand rule, Turquand rule, which is a rule of company law. You know, it comes from an old English case which said that when you're dealing with a company like, like in this situation like this, and there's an internal requirement that must be complied with, like, you know, uh, the company's, the MOI of this company is saying, well, there must be a managing director appointed, all right? When it says that and you're dealing with a company, you can assume that that internal requirement has been complied with. 
Okay? If you are dealing with a company at arm's length, then you can assume that it, that internal requirement has been complied with because your public knowledge of the company only goes so far. Your knowledge as an outsider of this company only goes up to the point that you know what it is saying in its MRI. You don't know what is going on in the board meetings, at the other meetings, what they decide internally. Okay, you cannot be party to that. And this is where the Turquoise rule comes in, and it says when you are dealing with such a situation, you can assume that it is that that internal requirement has been complied, with. as long as you are dealing in arm's length, and and and, of law, and you know. And you, uh, or you, you know, you definitely know that there was no authority given to the person. Okay. If you, had, if you had actual knowledge of it, then you can't rely on the turquoise rule. Then you knew that person who didn't have authority. Okay. Um, now the question is interesting. It is saying that. Um, now there was a, a contract. The, the um, managing director wasn't formally appointed, but Lacedi was carrying out the function of the managing director. She was entering into contracts on behalf of the company with the knowledge of the, 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 the other directors, and she created this impression now that she was, in fact, uh, the director, the managing director. And then she entered into a contract, and when they, they didn't, when they didn't honor the contract uh, and were sued, they said, "Oh, but the CAD wasn't appointed in terms of the MOI as the managing director." Now our questions are: Will they be bound by this contract? Bearing in mind the discussion we had now, uh, do you think that they will be bound by this contract? Yes. Okay. Why? I gave you one answer already. I've given you the one answer. I've said that in terms of company law and outsider, right, the Turquoise rule, right, you can assume uh, when there's an internal requirement, an internal formality that, that needs to be complied with. Then you can assume that it is being uh, complied with, All right? So you got the the companies act on your side from that point of view. Okay. Um, what about this thing called estoppel then? What is that all about? Uh, so I have a difficulty trying to grasp what you're saying. Um, my line is a bit bad. So oh, can you just man. repeat the question for me, please? Yeah, my question just was... Just the last one. Yes. That uh, what is the question... The question itself in the rubric says that, that you need to discuss the doctrine of estoppel. What is that? Uh... How does that fit into answering this question? Because I gave you half the answer, uh, but that is not the answer they want. The answer I gave you was one part of an answer, which was that, you know, when uh, the, the, the Turk won the rule, but there's also the doctrine of estoppel. So what is that? How does that uh, factor into that? How does that answer the question? What is estoppel? You need to discuss estoppel when uh, arguing or when answering the question um, that the, con the, con the, the company will be bound by the contract. You need to discuss the doctrine of estoppel. Did you hear that, uh, Ms. Kamala? Okay, so what is estoppel? Who, who knows what estoppel is? 
Okay, so estoppel is a defense, okay? It's a legal defense, okay? We make notes for you here. So estoppel, defense. Okay. Now, when when the company was sued, they said, what did they say? Oh, the CID doesn't have authority. She wasn't appointed as a managing director. Okay. So estoppel is a defense when somebody raises that point, when somebody says, oh, but she never had authority. So then one could counter this argument with the doctrine, the law of estoppel. Estoppel is a defense against uh, a claim where representation Okay, so it's a defense against a representation or a, represent, a misrepresentation that was made. Okay, so these are the requirements of, of the doctrine, the legal doctrine of estoppel, where somebody made a representation or misrepresentation. So in this case, who made a representation or a misrepresentation? Yes, Ms. Kamalu, the CD or the company rather, right? The CD was acting as a director of the uh, of the company uh, and she made the representations. What representation or misrepresentation, depending how you look at it, did she make? Mm, okay, let me consider what you've written here. So, Ms. Kamal, are you saying the misrepresentation she made was to enter into a contract without the knowledge of other board members? But let's deal with that and we start to see. We see the, with the rubric, the question says that, um, that uh, the CD, though never appointed as, as the managing director, acted as a managing director with the full knowledge of the board of directors. That's what the question says, right? So she is not like she did it without the authority. They knew she was doing this, the other directors, that she was acting in the role of managing director, which the MOI said that, you know, it's required because that represents the company. I saw it somewhere. I just can't really cross back. I saw this on the study guide. And if I'm not, um, if I'm not correct, it stated that if someone acts on behalf or enters into a contract and on behalf of the company or falsely misrepresents themselves and there's some legal or some suing, um, the company needs to take full responsibility of it. Yes, but now that is, yes, now that's what I'm trying to clarify. You've got sort of a, an understanding of it, Ms. Kamalu, but uh, it is not going to get you the marks for five marks, okay? You need to explain where they've asked you to explain estoppel. In this example, we've got this company with an MOI that is saying that there should be a managing director. And that, that managing director is the one that will represent the company and sign contracts on behalf of the company. The question also says, well, the, you know, although there's not a managing director appointed, there are other directors. 
they're representing the company, like Lesedi and the other person, and they also have other nominees. All right. So we have the MOI saying something that is not being formally complied with. And Lesedi is acting in that position. Okay. Um, and uh, with the knowledge, the question says with the knowledge of the board. So it's not like the, the other directors didn't know she's doing it. In fact, by them knowing about it, they are uh, condoning it. They are ratifying the conduct of the director and of the company as such. Okay. Um, so where is your other answers? You three guys still aware? Is at the end of it here. Yeah. So um, what they are actually doing is they creating the impression. My question was what representation was made by the CD, and the CD made a representation or misrepresentation by what was it? You tell me the type of statement and you tell me if you agree with me. So this is, do you agree that that uh, we know that the CD made a misrepresentation? She created the impression to the to third parties or outsiders that she did have the authority to represent the company. Yes, okay, that is correct, Ms. Litchi. Yes, that acting as a managing director where is not formally appointed. Although the MOI says she should be uh, a, a, a managing director should be appointed. So that was the impression she created. Now remember. The estoppel is a defense against somebody who makes you believe something. So Lesedi is making outsiders or this company that they entered into contracts with believe that she did have the authority. And that third party, this is the second part of estoppel, which you need to in your answer, that outsider or third party Okay, so this is the other requirement that that outsider we post it um, that outsider or third party acted upon these representations or misrepresentations of the CD to their detriment. Okay, this is the second part of the estoppel defense. Okay. That uh, firstly, that impression was created. There were misrepresentations made. Right? Made you believe something. You, the CD made this, this company believe she was the managing director. Right? The company made her believe, in fact, because the other directors are also not saying anything. So this company that did business with them didn't know that she wasn't formally appointed but they are being made to believe that she was formally appointed by the way she's behaving and the way the company is behaving. They're not objecting, they're not saying anything. And they're not, so this is the impression. So this company that did the business with this, with Perry Limited now, acted upon these representations and it was to their detriment, it was to their prejudice. Why? Because now they're raising the point that 
or we, we don't, that person never had with God. Okay? Then, uh, if they do so, uh, the party who uh, created or made Okay, so then the party who made the representations, who made the misrepresentations or the misrepresentations, let's say, will be stopped, will be prevented from raising the truth that is that she doesn't, she doesn't have the authority. Okay, so in simple terms, very, 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 very simple terms, she made the people believe that she was the managing director. The people believed her and went into business with her. Right? The, the reality is she, she wasn't formally appointed. She didn't have this authority, but she created the impression. And as a result of creating this impression and the people believing her and going into business with her, uh, she now can't now say, oh, you know what? I don't have the authority. Okay, so that in essence is what you must, you must discuss it in the answer like that. Okay, where those elements are there. Estoppel is the defense uh, against representations or misrepresentations that are made uh, and the inducing people to, to believe you and to act upon your misrepresentation, to go into a contract with you to their detriment, to their prejudice. And as a result, they are in trouble. And uh, when that is the case, then you can't really uh, say that you don't have the authority when you make people believe that you did have the authority. And then they will be stopped. They will be prevented from saying we don't have the authority. <laughs> I hope that is clear. It's a bit of a complex thing, uh, but um, you know, it's it's something that exists not only in company law. It exists in all uh, situations where anybody. It's a general defense against uh, you know people who mislead you, uh, who don't have authority, but they but they create the impression that they do. Okay. Any questions on that? Oh, I see we're out of time now, guys. Uh, when are you writing your exam? When are you writing your, when is your paper coming up? I'm happy, Ms. Kamalo. Uh, it does take people, time, sometimes takes people a lot of time to get to understand the doctrine of estoppel. I'm happy you've understood it. Um, okay, well, before then, you may, uh, you know, request a one-on-one -on -one one -on -one session with those areas that you still have difficulty with. I mean, for example, the, the doctrine of estoppel, um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time on that now, but it is worth it because it will come up now in an exam and in other parts of your studies as well. Uh, and, you know, it's... Uh, so if there's other concepts or difficulties you're having, you can, you know, request a session and hopefully before you write... Uh, I can still, uh, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one session with you. Um, but yeah, it's not going to be so bad, guys. You've got the exam to take home with you. You've got it overnight with you. Um, you how to effectively prepare for that is, of course, to have ready answers to those questions, wherever you're going to be, you know, um, answering them. You need to answer them online. Okay. Uh, obviously, uh, an examiner who examines a paper like that will examine it more strictly, considering that you have access to, you know, to look at other books and, you know, answers and, you know, so bear that in mind, that not, you don't just answer these questions in the exam, uh, you know, too loosely or too casually or without authority and without references. All right.